12 multifamily properties in 12 months using none of their own money. This is what Mel and Dave were able to do recently. And in this video, they will explain how they were able to do that. Mel and Dave break down why they prefer not to have partners on their deals, how they use seller financing, vendor takebacks, and borrowed money to acquire, renovate, and then refinance their properties, leaving them with cash flowing assets that they own 100% of. Stick around until the end of the video where Mel and Dave share their secrets to their success and the things that you should be doing right now to see similar results in your real estate investing portfolio. Hey, what's up? Darren Voros here. My mission is to help you reduce your real estate investing education time from months to minutes. Subscribe not to miss what's coming. And now enjoy the interview. You guys have come up with this model that is essentially you're buying properties, multifamily properties for the most part, using other people's money, uh, but you still own it 100% outright. Explain how that works. Yeah, we're borrowing that money. We have private lenders, private investors, creative financing, owner financing, vendor take back, seller finance. Everyone calls it a different thing, right? Yeah, using other people's money in order to purchase real estate and instead of giving equity or, or partnerships, just because that, that wouldn't work for Mel and I, and I know it works for some people, but our structure, we want to give everything to our kids, right? Down the road. So we need to solely own it. So we utilize other people's money. We give them interest, obviously, and they entrust us with our deals because we make sure to only buy good ones that are going to cash flow and be able to, to pay them back. Can we walk through a, a deal or two and just explain how you how you're able to do that? The realtor had a pocket deal, you know, a pocket listing where they didn't want to list it and they thought if you know someone, it was a sixplex. Uh, we purchased it for five seventy five. dollars It was a widowed lady. Her husband had built the building. He was the real estate investor. She saw it as a burden and a problem. Pocket deal, we come along, hey, we have a credit union that is going to give us 75% uh, first mortgage. If you can, and this was one of the 12 and 12, if you can yes. hold the second mortgage. So she held the second mortgage and this was a true win-win for her. Um, she was able to get rid of the property and then we were able to increase its value. So what we refer to often is forced appreciation. It truly really was an underperforming property. The rents were really, really yeah. low. There was one unit that needed to be redone as well. But other than that, the other units were in excellent condition. So we knew we didn't have to put too much money into it. Short story. TLC got that one unit that was down to the studs, uh, renovated, rented, up the other rents. That was 2017, and we just refinanced it uh, during COVID with CMHC. Obviously, got a new first mortgage, paid her out, paid the existing mortgage. We're left with a cash flowing asset, cash flow every month, and we put no money into the deal technically, right? Everyone else's mm -hmm. money. Yeah. And now we, we keep cash flowing. So, an infinite return deal, right? What was the term of that loan, and, and what did that loan look like? So, interest rate, you know, you, you mentioned about 27, 20, maybe you know, maybe 36 months. Was that the initial term? Is there, was there an extension to that? How did that No, all so we did go with a five-year term. Okay. Um, and the reason we went five years is because we always want to, worst case scenario. So we figure mm -hmm. that it would come to fruition very early on, but we're all about making sure, of course, to have our exit strategy. We always talk about exit strategy. And what that means essentially is making sure that we can repay them back on time. Now, in this case, she, she took the money and kind of did her thing. Quite often what happens though, and this is where you as an investor, you're able to continue to grow from it. You pay them back and now they know you, they like you, they trust you, you pay them on time, you pay them back early, you never miss the payment, you communicated with them and now they want to do it all over again, whether they have another property to sell or not, or perhaps now they can become a private lender. And was the seller familiar with this strategy or did you guys have to explain it to them a little bit? No, this was her husband really passion for the real estate. She was in a situation where she's like, I want to get rid of this building and whatnot. It truly was a win-win a situation, but no, absolutely breaking it down, explaining to her why she should consider this, explaining to her and showing her most importantly, our exit strategy. We always use our matrix for that. So, so that was really, really important part of it all. You know, Mrs. Seller, let's let's call her that. Mrs. Seller, we're going to buy your property. We're going to give you the price that you're relatively asking for, right? Mm -hmm. But in, in turn, we're going to ask you to hold financing, which she had the building paid off. So, you know, it was no issue. Uh, we're going to pay you interest on this endeavor. And it's going to help you tax-wise because if, you know, someone comes along and gives you the entire purchase price of five seventy five, you're going to be taxed on that entire amount in the year you receive it. However, if you let us purchase the building with owner financing, and I forget what the numbers are. Let me just use easy numbers here. Let's say it's 350 or 370 is what she received in that year from the bank, right? For the first mortgage. Yep. So now you're going to receive 370. You're going to be taxed on that amount and whatever's left over, you can spread over, I think up to a max of five years and you're going to make interest on that and your headache goes away 
immediately. So she was ready to sign the papers, right? But yeah. She was done. Um, so this one was a sixplex. We've done it on smaller. We've done it on bigger units. So the number of units don't matter. It's just a matter of, is it a good fit for the seller? And are you going to get some no's? Absolutely. Even when we bought 12 in 12 months. So it's really making sure to be comfortable with getting some no's because it doesn't work for everyone. And also ensuring not to get too excited because you, oh, I can get into this deal with no, no money down. Well, that's great, but you have to look out for, your, for the future as well, making sure that you truly have that clear exit strategy. Is there any sort of, uh, um, like I say, pushback on what your skills are as renovators and how you're going to turn this building over? Well, in our situation, we'll be able to show them past renovations and past experience. But again, everyone's been there their first time, right? I'm thinking back to try and help as many people. The first time that we had that objection, we basically just laid out our game plan. Here's our maintenance team. Here's our contractor. So just showing them the legwork that you have done if you've not done it before, right? Like you're going to get those quotes and get those prices and, and check out some materials that you're going to put in. Other objections we get, Darren, is I need to talk to my accountant and my lawyer. And absolutely go talk to your accountant, go talk to your lawyer. And they're going to have an opinion, which again, is fair, right? So they're, they're lawyers going to say, you know, what if, what if, what if to the nth degree and be ready to answer those questions. Yes. But after I've told you my plan, after I've laid out what we're going to do with it, you're actually going to be taking back a better building than what you gave it to us. And you'll have a better evaluation there. And the accountants, same thing. They'll say, well, you know, They'll talk about taxes and all that, but in the grand scheme of things, they have to be comfortable, but be ready for those objections because they're coming. And I can't stress this enough, the communications piece, and it doesn't have to be consistent, but it has to be there absolutely throughout the relationship of, of where the building's at or whatever it is. It makes them feel good, They, right? they mm -hmm. love it. They love the updates. Yeah, sure yeah. You mentioned the renovation and because you use OPM, how did you finance that? Either with our own savings or sometimes we'll do the fund to flip, right? Where we'll say to someone, hey, we need 50K. Uh, here's the, the, the very clear, precise plan. It's going to be a promissory no contractual agreement and you'll be paid as soon as we refinance. And then we'll show them, boom, our cash flow analysis matrix, which shows them factual numbers and, and predictions uh, on, on market and, and rents and that type of thing. And then obviously when the refinance happens, uh, what's the order that you pay out? So the order will be the, you know, the first and second mortgages, right? Because the lawyers, they kind of take care of all of that. But let's say we had a one year term. We'll ask them, we'll say, hey, we just refinanced right now. Here are the funds. Do you want to keep going? Do you want to add it on? And they, they might say, well, we have six months left. Let's wait and pay me back then because I want to keep making interest. So it's working with the lenders. And I will say this little little pro tip here on the, on the <laughs> side. Okay, it's time to, to pay them back and they agree to lend you the money right away to do something else with it. Actually do pay them back. And I think it truly builds that trust because now it's no longer of, oh, could they really afford to pay you back? Why are they rolling it over? Why are they rolling it over? No, we're, let's finish this transaction and start fresh. And again, it just builds that trust with the lenders. I, I just want to kind of close out with asking you guys to give us a bit of advice uh, for folks that are looking to do similar things to what you're doing. So what's a sort of a first step in, in going along this path of using OPM, owning things outright? Don't stop yourself and don't use excuses. You know, even when I started, I was a single mom living in a two bedroom apartment and thinking like, how am I ever going to get out of this mess? And it's doable. And the reality is everybody is limitless. Everybody can do it. You just have to get that knowledge and take action. So if you're scared, you know, take action. If you're scared, get educated and, and just keep moving and making progression every single day. <laughs> because it's something that, that that affected me in the beginning was the naysayers, that upset stomach of, should I be listening to them? Are they right? Putting all those terrible thoughts in your head and then having that breakthrough of, why am I listening to someone who hasn't done what I want to do? Who doesn't, who hasn't accomplished something? So just don't listen to naysayers. Listen to people that are more successful than you because they're going to tell you, hey, it's doable and go for whatever you want in life. I couldn't agree more with Mel and Dave on the things that hold most investors back from achieving success. A lack of education and listening to naysayers can definitely have a negative impact on you and your progress. If you're looking to beef up your education, check out my website at darrenvoros.com for more information on the various courses and mentorship programs that I offer. If you're unsure of which strategies you should be focusing on, take the 30 second assessment below, which will tell you what kind of strategies you should be using based on your skill set and your qualifications. If you have questions for me, leave those in the comments section below. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram where I post regularly. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on Tuesday.